Hello chess lovers, welcome back. Round 13 is on the menu today and we are going to look at the only decisive game which was played between Hikaru and Jan Zhishtov Duda. Before I get into the game, um, obviously now you guys know that Jan Nepomniachny Nepo won the uh, candidates. Congratulations to Nepo. Fully deserved, played the best chess, uh, made the most of his chances. Uh, until now is undefeated and with uh, one round to spare he is already the challenger of the world champion Magnus Carlsen. Now whether Maggie will play or not is another story but either case Nepo is definitely playing for the crown uh, irrespective of opponent. But now back to round 13 which actually did have a great impact on uh, a potential second challenger if you will. So let's have a look at how um, the Hikaru Duda game went. Well, actually, it went exactly like uh, Hikaru's game two rounds before in the night off with this H3 variation. Um, it's a very interesting setup in the sense that it definitely does not yield any advantage to white, but it does yield a, a rather playable position. And as per discussed already many times uh, in my recap videos, it seems to be the new trend in the 21st century, absolute top, top, top elite level of chess, where players seem to know all the drawing variations. And so in order to play for a win, uh, what you need to do is not to find an advantage, which is borderline impossible, but instead to find a position that is rich and playable. And that is exactly what Hikaru managed to drum up uh, for the second time, by the way, with this uh, strange knight f3 variation, bishop c, h3, bishop c4. And here comes uh, the deviation from Hikaru Alireza, which saw knight c6, bishop e6. As far as I'm concerned, a much more logical move, by the way. Bishop b3 and then knight c6 is a weird mixture, but uh, by engines measured best. Uh, knight e7 and queen c7 are also known um, moves here and then white has got some knight h4 ideas as well I will refer to them in a second because Hikaru actually played here knight h4 and in his recap actually I don't think he mentioned the move here that uh, I found quite curious so anytime you play knight h4 the first thing you look at is the possibility of knight e4 right because the knight is loose and usually this idea does not work um, because um, Knight takes e4, knight takes e4, bishop h4, knight d6, or rather bishop e6, fe, and then knight d6 check, and black falls apart, loses castling rights, yada yada yada, unplayable story, yeah? And most players call it off like that, that okay, knight e4 doesn't work, and I'm not saying that Hikaru did that, but curiously, after knight e4, black actually has d5. And according to the engine, this position is dead even. Now, the point of d5, of course, is that it now keeps uh, two knights attacked. Um, but, of course, black is aiming to take this one if they can help it. So, um, if white plays, for example, g3, then uh, we are going to land in a supremely exciting endgame as far as structure is concerned. Because we are going to have a set of triple pawns. But there is a potential double pawns here as well. So rook g8 is played. And after rook... Uh, sorry, knight g6 is played. And after rook g8, despite the, uh, the triple pawns... Mind you, one of those boys is an extra. In fact, 2, 4, 6, 7. Yeah, one of them is extra. Um, yeah. Very, very messy stuff. It's dead even according to the engine. I don't even know which, which color I would prefer to play this with. So, yeah, this, this was definitely an interesting and exciting possibility uh, that uh, sort of uh, flew under the radar. Um, but, yeah, knight a5 was played, and now the idea of plugging a knight on g6 came to fruition. And here Hikaru's comments were very interesting and really, really educational as far as I'm concerned. I really enjoyed listening in. He considered here his position to be better partly because of the g6 knight is a total pain, but also because of the subsequent plans such as castles, play f4, playing against the king stuck in the middle, just made it uh, quite attractive. And according to Hikaru here, um, Duda played a fair number of moves that he did not anticipate. So here Hikaru continuously expected king f7 um, with a subsequent trade on e7 and then these f4 plans would have come into the play and uh, instead knight c4 was played and then instead rook c8 was played and here Hikaru made a very strange decision 
to my liking and to my understanding, especially in light of what he was talking about previously. Here he played h4 with the idea of cementing the knight in on, h, uh, on g6 by playing h5. Now this made little sense to me, considering that he continuously wanted black to play, play king f7 and then take on e7 and grab the advantage with f4. So to my mind, and by the way, the, his, uh, his variation that he mentioned uh, instead of rook c8 in the video looked like here, 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 b3. And I don't even remember if he analyzed knight b6 or knight a5, but either case, he mentioned here that white had a very good position with, you know, f4, the bishop can come to b2 or a3, and the king is very insecure in the middle. And as I'm watching it, I'm like, yep. Yep, yep, I'm full of it, you bro, that this is looking absolute golden, it's mint. And so, after rook c8, I would have thought that the logical continuation, and he did not reflect on this at all, would have been to play b3. And if uh, Horsey goes back to wherever, and I'm not being, not meaning to suggest, you know, that I understand his position better than he does, uh, because that's certainly not the case, but um, it seems to me that, you know, uh, we play bishop b2, we're waiting for the knight to be kicked, and as soon as it gets kicked, we take on e7, whatever it takes back, we are going to land in an almost identical scenario to what he described as his dream position. So I don't get why in this position there was a change of heart and, you know, focusing on fixing the knight on g6 rather than entering this variation with knight e7. And once again, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck here, I'm actually following his train of thoughts. I think this would have been a very clear and very logical follow-up with the subsequent f4 plan. And I really do like white here exactly for those reasons. Don't know why he didn't do it and he didn't reflect on it in the recap as far as I'm aware. Um, the h4 idea was exciting, but objectively speaking, um, I don't think it's anywhere near as good as uh, b3 would have been. Queen f3, king f7, and now it is obviously much better to to follow up with h5 and indeed rely on the power of the knight. But this position seems to be more tenable for black. Knight d1 was played and here Hikaru admitted that he overlooked this interesting plan of wanting to trade the knight. And I think with that the majority of the advantage from white's point of view is gone but the position remains super duper exciting. There was a variation here that uh, Hikaru mentioned, and I quite like as well, so I would like to show you this, which is knight g4 trying to turn on the heat around the king, introducing this bishop h6 idea. And indeed here, knight f8, to follow the plan, is actually not going to work um, because of uh, take and then take and then take. I'll play this out for you. So take, 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 take. And uh, after multiple trades, this is going to drop in the end. Or if queen takes, we have queen b3 with the idea of hitting b7 and threatening with f4. This looks like dynamite. And if they uh, um, take with the g, then we can pick off h6, and that looks really good too. However, the really enticing variation here is bishop, uh, excuse me, rook takes c2, when we go boom shki baby, and now all of a sudden, we have got a fair bit of attackers around the black king, and the star variation goes takes, takes, and h6. Uh, and the pawn is offering itself for a trade because now after queen h5 we have got a knight hanging and some really delicious juicy discovered checks incoming and after knight f7 comes the beautiful finish knight h8 not every day you see a knight on f7 being trapped or you know out muscled by a knight on h8 and the combined power with the queen on h5 and the pin along down the diagonal so that would have been an interesting line but instead we opted for this c4 scenario by we i mean uh hikaru and his favorite youtuber um and we went knight h4 back knight g knight h7 and now was the big call to make which was to sack the e4 pawn and i really like the fact that hikaru went for it because Objectively speaking, the position remains equal in terms of the most likely outcome, but it now becomes immensely rich and wealthy in terms of tactical ideas and tactical possibilities, because the subsequent f4 is going to um, mean that white is going to gain huge initiative here against the king in the middle. Now, very interestingly, Hikaru said he, he thought 
that his position was much better here, and I agree with him. To a human, this looks really good for white. And so he was slightly shocked when he checked with the engine learning that this was not quite the case. But I dare say, even knowing what he knows now, he would enter this again in a heartbeat with white, simply because it's so much easier to play and so much more fun to play a position like this with white than with black. Okay, so rookie eight, knight g6, very logically now we are building up the attack. Rook d1, all the boys are joining the party as per the rule of Yasser. Knight g4, bish d8, trading off one of the knights. So now we have got clarity on the board. Uh, we have got the f4 idea and we have got the rook double idea. And here there was something very curious that I really liked uh, about... Uh, Hikaru's analysis that he called this a terrible mistake, which according to the engine's measure, by the way, the best move. And again, his uh, presentation was remarkably compelling. So he really was kicking himself for not playing rook d3 right away. And the difference here is, is that the idea behind rook d3 is that he wants to play um, against b5 rook d1 which is really cool, and now after take, 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 obviously d6 drops, but more importantly, he actually has here a c5 push idea, so let's say argument sake b4, and then you have c5, and this move dismantles this pawn mass beautifully. Note that if uh, rook takes, we take d6, and now these pawns are just gonski, and if they take this way, we again, <coughs> excuse me, take on e5, and uh, with the penetrating white pieces, this is all over Red Rover. But unfortunately, instead Hikaru went Rook D2, wanting to even eliminate the Rook C2 options from black. But what that meant was that he walked into this tempo. And now we achieve the same position um, with uh, a slightly different layout for black, which means that after B5, he didn't have C5 anymore. And that sucked, because now after c5, knight c5, obviously, is just a win for black. And now taking here means that rook c2 is incoming, which is also rather unpleasant, because now the bishop covering d2 means we can't come back to d2, and so white is losing a piece. And all of a sudden, Hikaru figured that he was in a world of hurt. Played bishop a3, his best practical chance, but now after b4, bishop b2, the position would have remained slightly in favor of black that much is for sure but he for some reason which is uh, quite mysterious to me duda wanted to go for broke and perhaps wanted to be very smart too and he went for d5 now the idea behind this move is quite easy to understand and that is is that after take on d5 rook c2 queen random whatever b4 traps the bishop Actually, I went a little bit further, I calculated DE, but after knight c5, indeed, the bishop is trapped, the rook is hanging, this is ugly, black is winning. But actually, he overlooked here a very nice tactical source, uh, and that was that after ED, rook c2, bishop d6, countermeasure. The good old adage of when your opponent attacks your piece, always reckon with, um, or rather when you attack your opponent's piece, always reckon with them counterattacking yours. Uh, here works uh, like a charm, all of a sudden, um, all black's advantage is gone. And now, um, the best way to bail out is actually to take the queen and enter this endgame, but that's a very rude shock, and uh, to recover from such a shock is never easy, because here, when he played d5, he thought Hikaru was uh, on the verge of defeat. And, you know, that is a psychological stance or position where you are really pumped up and happy and you go like, yeah, baby, I'm going for it, only to find out a move later as a cold shower that, not even close, mate, you will be happy to survive. And to adjust to that at any level of chess, it doesn't matter what level you play on, is a remarkably difficult. Um, yeah, rook e2 was essentially forced. Note that queen d6 loses to queen c2, which is the core idea uh, behind this bishop d6 uh, strike. Um, so rook e2 was played, bishop c7 was played, knight c5, and here Hikaru played d6, which is a very human move again, and I really do like it for its practical value. Although, according to the engine, after takes, takes, and e4, um, black holds a draw, which is uh, quite interesting. Uh, or rather, d7, which is actually what was played in the game, 
Oh no, it wasn't played in the game, excuse me. Uh, Knight d7 was played in the game, but d7 was the main variation that Hikaru also reckoned with. And after rook a8, rook d3, we have got this very curious endgame scenario where um, it looks like um, black should hold. Now, I think I analyzed here rook a2. Yes, I did. And this is a really fascinating variation, which actually leads to a really, really exciting draw. So let's check this out. d8 queen takes, takes a4. And now the A pawn that is really far away from all the white pieces becomes an absolute menace. And in fact, white's best strategy, believe it or not, is to entirely ignore it and go after the king. And this really strange imbalance between white focusing and um, directing all his pieces onto the black king versus black putting all of um, his eggs in one basket, which is the A4 pawn, will lead to a very fascinating draw variation with this Repet repetition of moves. If black decides to avoid said repetition, bishop f6 comes just on time uh, with a marvelous mate threat on g7, by the way. And if now black plays rook h1 check, we need to dodge that bullet. Note that taking allows black to get a queen, and then rook a7 uh, is going to win the game because now the mate threat has been handled. So instead of taking the rook, we need to go king g3, and now. If they play rook g8, note that uh, obviously promoting to queen is mating one. So if they play rook g8 to stop the threat, then we go check. And now it's either repetition here or they can uh, take the knight. In which case we go check and there is a, a marvelous perpetual check here with uh, this semi windmill idea. That would have been the most logical and the best outcome for black. But... Jan Zhishtov Duda shaken by um, the previous blunder. He plays knight d7. And from here on out, this game is essentially over uh, on this level of chess. The knight is ridiculously passive. And now there is absolutely zilch. Nothing to be done against uh, rook c3, rook c7. Bishop d8 was the best indeed. Rook c3, bishop uh, b6. And here Hikaru calculated rook c7, which does win. But um, there was a variation there, which, by the way, I was super impressed by, and I'm pretty sure I won't be able to recreate it, where he calculated a variation where the rook went back to a8. And so he thought to himself, why don't I play king h2 first, forcing the rook to the take on f2, and then play rook c7, when after take, take, the rook has no time to go back, know that f8 is occupied, and after knight f6, rook d8 just simply mops up. These are the little subtleties that... You don't necessarily get when you're watching the game, but when it's explained, it's so beautifully crystal clear, right? So if you are watching here and uh, they go king h2, you go like, what on earth is that? And when it's explained and you understand the concept behind it and the depth, it becomes such a genius idea to disallow the rook to go back and luring it to take here first, which is, by the way, a completely meaningless pawn, so that now there is no way to go back with the rook uh, to manage the situation. So in comparison to that, for example, if we go rook c7, bishop takes, pawn takes, let's say, um, I don't even know, like let's go knight f6. If we go rook d8, rook a8, uh, I thought was holding, but apparently knight c7 check wins here too. So I forget, maybe it's knight b6. That's right, this was Hikaru's line. Knight d5, and at one point knight d7, yeah, knight d7, bishop e7, and then the rook goes back to a8. And if you put it in your engine, it's going to tell you that it's winning like mad. But as a human, when you calculate into this from this position, so you need to see that with crystal clear clarity, that position there, I totally understand why um, Hikaru would be like, yeah, it doesn't look that clear, this position. Like, why am I winning this? Like, if bishop d8, rook c8... And it's very difficult to kick the rook out from c8. And if I move off of the d5 with the rook, immediate sacrifice comes. So there are technical issues here, despite the huge uh, edge according to the engine. And so hence king h2, I reckon this is an incredibly beautiful example of prophylaxis and just clever, practical thinking. And Duda did not take f2, by the way. But the move he played was also really, really bad. Or rather, sorry, I shouldn't say bad, it's just hopeless. 
F3 securing the pawn and now the white rook side ready to penetrate and really from here on out there is not an awful lot to add it's just absolute carnage um Hikaru just penetrates and converts with ease if you compare the like for like pieces better knight than day and knight better bishop than their bishop the rooks are more active and on top of that we have got the d6 pawn it is just a complete uh mop up and he beautifully finishes off with a flourish here with d7 and uh, that is the end of the story because of course after knight takes we take with the rook and this marvelous knight fork finishes the job this was a really really exciting game with a lot of doing and throwing and uh, the advantage going and swinging back to uh, back and forth so definitely exciting chess was to be seen here and uh, I really like that, and um, that got rewarded by a win again uh, for Hikaru, who is now coming clear second. And so the last round uh, battle between Hikaru and Ding Liren is going to be either a huge excitement or a very quick draw. But I do think, do think, and I do hope that Ding Liren will try his mighty best behind the white pieces to win, because that would allow him. Um, to come second and be the challenger of well actually would allow him to hope to be part of the next match that's entirely up to Magnus so we are still looking at a very exciting uh, last round I dare say that the other three games will fizzle out very quickly into the draw into a draw but for that game alone I believe it's going to be worth uh, tuning in and watch the outcome and after that we will be holding our breath uh, to see what Magnus has to say. That is me for now. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I will be back with another hopefully very exciting last recap video tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to sub, to like, to comment and to super like. Um, thank you once again for watching. I will be back tomorrow.